Good afternoon, and welcome to Korean Literature Weekly. I'm your host, Mr. Alan Friesen. Big time! Today we're going to be talking about the short story, Cranes, or A Crane, by Hwang Sun Won. We're going to be looking at some of the important features of it. I'm not going to be going over the entire story in detail, but pulling out various threads that we can examine, like a string of yarn that one might use as a belt. <laughs> Uh -huh. okay. LOL. Let's talk about first of all the central figure in the, or the central metaphor in this story, which is the crane. In Korean culture, the crane represents immortality and long life. It was believed that the nobles in Korea, back in the Joseon dynasty, if you died, you came back as a crane. They're very noble, very beautiful creatures. It's rumored that they lived 1600 years. Uh -huh. So, we've got this, these cranes that are present not just in the title, but also throughout the middle and at the very end of the story. And we've got two main characters here, Sang Sam and Tok Che. Sang Sam and Tok Che. So the story begins with the sentence, This village to the north of the 38th parallel demarcation line was lying utterly still beneath the lofty, clear autumn sky. The language here is a clear indication of the story's setting. The fact that we're talking about north of the 38th parallel indicates that this takes place not only in Korea, but it takes place in Korea after 1945, after the country was split into two. And in fact, we are talking about North Korea here. So, the first thing that we see is this very idyllic pasture. We see a very beautiful image of this town, about how this neighborhood suffered a little damage. You've got dirt floors, you've got gourds, you've got this very rural setting, something that we are very familiar with here in Lundbrecht, Alberta. Song Sam comes into the story he pauses by the chestnut trees. This is the first character that we have in the story. And our inclination is for us to treat him as the protagonist. That is the main character or the good guy. First guy. This is the perspective through which we see the story. He comes into the town. People start scrambling. He wonders, maybe that old man with the when had died too. Does anybody know what a when is? W-E-N? Some kind of bird. I highlighted that. A when is a boil. Oh. If you were to look it up. What's a boil? So maybe that old man with the boil had died too. It's like something that sits on your neck. Obviously the fact that this guy is known as the old guy with the boil means that it was pretty big. It was a very noticeable feature. He comes into the city, or he comes into the village, and he sees that there's a youth who is tied up with a rope. This, as we discover, is going to be Tok Che. It was the first youth he had seen in the village. He went closer and examined his face. He was startled. Why? It was Tok Che, his best friend, as a child. He asked the member of the security team who had accompanied him from Chon Te about him. So we know that Song Sam has come up from Chon Te, which is in the south, with a member of a security team. So what this is telling us is that there are people, there are soldiers from South Korea who are coming into North Korea. This is before the demarcation line was marked with, um, with mines, before it had walls and chain link vents and barbed wire blocking off the two countries. So again, we can narrow down the date in which this story takes place a little bit further. But we have a southern Korean person coming into the village, which is in North Korea. Oh, this, is, this is strange. This is strange. How does this South Korean person know this person from North Korea? How does Song Sam know Tok Chang? And as we find out later, they both grew up in the same village. They're both from the same place, and that is where they are now. So. The narrator talks about how it was decided that Top J would be taken to Chongtown. He would be, because he is the vice chairman of the Peasants League. The vice chairman of the Peasants League. This is another indication that the story is taking place in North Korea. The Peasants League. This is very, this is Stalinist language. 
and then Song Sam decides to take him there himself. So they left the village, they're going south. He's remembering, Song Sam is, remembers an incident in their youth where um, Tokche was nice to them. They were stealing chestnuts from the old man with the, with the boils tree. So, uh, Song Sam wasn't able to steal any chestnuts, and he was very sad about it, but Tong Nei did, and he shared with him. So, again, we, from a Western point of view, if we know all the facts behind the story, we should be, we should be scratching our heads right about now. You've got this guy, Mr. Friesen, you're telling me, from South Korea, who's going up into North Korea, who knows a guy from North Korea, and the guy from South Korea is remembering the North Korean guy with kindness. He was a nice guy. Up to this point, everything in the story fits our Western point of view. We have a South Korean guy going into North Korea and capturing one of those evil North Koreans. Yay, America. This makes sense. But then he remembers him with, with kindness. And later on in the story, we're going to find that the entire morality that we have imposed upon the text becomes inverted. So Song Sam remembers this, the, uh, the kindness, and he gets upset. He feels this tension between his duty as a South Korean officer and between his memories of this person who is his friend. He says, I'm filled with a sudden surge of unexpected rage, Song Sam shouted, Hey fellow, how many people did you kill during the war? He doesn't reply. He doesn't say anything. He's asked again and again. He doesn't say anything. And then he asks, Why would someone who had been vice chairman of the Peasants League stay put and not run away? Were you hiding for some kind of mission? So what Song Sam is saying here is, he's saying, You were a political entity in this village. You were important in this village. You knew we were coming. Why didn't you try to escape? And the suspicious mind is immediately thinking, and, and Song Sam echoes this, are you, are you planning some sort of mission? Were you planning on trying to hide so that you could somehow come into South Korea and wreck our terrible, our, our great country? Terrible. Because South Korea is the good guys, and North Korea is the bad guys. This is what we think as 21st century readers. We automatically put that worldview into our minds when we think of North Korea and South Korea. And he doesn't, he, he doesn't make excuses. I was made vice chairman of the Peasants League because I was the son of the poorest peasant and reckoned a hard worker. If that's a crime deserving death, well then, okay. Now as before, I'm a guy who's good at nothing but farming. Now father's lying sick at home. It's already been half a year. And then, We've got Song Sam saying, didn't you get married? We talked in an earlier lecture about the, uh, the questions that people ask each other when they first meet each other to deserve a social class. Now obviously somebody from North Korea and somebody from South Korea, their, their, their classes aren't compatible. They are enemies to this day. They are at war with each other. At least that's what our own Western perspective wants us to think. So they talk about their children. And then there's this interesting part in this section where they talk about, you know, he talks about the fact that he's going to have a child. This is Tom Nei. He's going to have a child with Mimi. And then Tom, uh, sorry, then Song Sam says, anyway, didn't you realize what would happen if you stayed instead of running away? To which Tom Che replies, I was intending to run away. They said that when the southerners moved north, they would kill every man without exceptions, and they obliged all the men between 17 and 40 to go north. I thought of running away, even carrying father on my back. Then father said no. He said no one ever heard of a farmer planting all his crops, then running away somewhere, leaving everything behind. The reason that Top Chang didn't escape was because he was being a good son. This fits right into our notion of an ideal Confucius gentleman. He stayed behind because his father asked him not to. He wanted him to help him deal with the crops because he was sick. And then in the very next paragraph, we get the truth behind Song Sam's story. Back in June, it had been Song Sam's turn to evacuate. That night, he had told his father secretly they should get out. Then his father had said just the same thing. How can a farmer leave his farming and go running off somewhere? 
Song Sam had left alone. As he went wandering among unfamiliar roads and villages, the thought of the farm work he had left in the hands of his elderly parents and youthful bride never left him. So, whereas Tokche stayed behind in order to look after his father and risk capture at the hands of the southerners, the North Korean government said that they would be killed. He stayed behind because he was a dutiful son. But Song Sam, early in the war, had escaped and had gone south and had seeked his fortune. And by doing so, he proved himself to be an unloyal son. He proved himself to be outside of this order of Confucianism we talked about earlier. He left his wife and his father behind and only cared about himself. This inverts the moral structure of the story. Now, instead of a southerner going to the north in order to arrest those evil North Korean criminals, we have a southerner who was a rebel. And in Korean terms, this is bad. We have this rebel who comes up north and discovers his best friend who was a loyal and good Korean citizen. This confounds everything that we would think about this story. And at the very end of the story, Song Sam, the southerner, says, let's go crane hunting. He's referring to the time when they were both children and they had secretly captured a crane. And then they had let it go shortly before it had been shot. So he's saying, let's go crane hunting. Why don't you, you know, hurry up and send some cranes over. Why don't you go run over there and see if you can get some cranes to fly out from the ground. He's not telling them to go hunt cranes. He's saying, okay, you know what? This is your chance. Why don't you go run? Why don't you escape? So at the very end of the story, we have this person who is a rebel, who betrays his father, betrays his, his, um, his bride. He decides that he can no longer do this to his best friend and he lets his best friend escape. At that point, just then, a few red-crowned cranes were slowly flying with outstretched wings across the high blue autumn sky. And as we talked about earlier, the cranes represent long life. They represent immortality. And it's my belief that what they're talking about is not the immortality of any of these characters. They're not even really talking about the immortality of North Korea or South Korea. They're talking about the immortality of the Korean spirit. Song Sam realizes that he's made a mistake by breaking these established rules of Korean society. Not North Korean society, not South Korean society, but the essence of Koreanness. He has broken it. And he's trying to mend it by allowing his friend to escape instead of being taken back south, tortured and possibly killed by the South Korean government. And because he does this, we have the author of creating this flock of cranes that fly overhead as a very powerful symbol that despite what might happen between the North Koreans and the South Koreans, this Korean spirit must live on. And that's it. That's the story. Nicely done. <laughs>